What's up everybody? Brent Phillips with Real Estate Fundamentals and we are covering another, yes, another house flipping case study. We're going to go in depth into these numbers. I'm going to share some techniques and tactics that we utilize in our business that honestly, like I don't see most other flippers uh, utilizing. So if you're just getting started or perhaps you're an experienced real estate flipper yourself, I'm sure you're going to gain some insights if you stick through the whole video. So I have a lot to share here. I'm going to share you with you not only our numbers, we're going to go really in depth with our numbers, show you exactly how we did on this deal and we didn't do as good as we thought we were going to do. And so I'm going to show you some of those reasons why. Some other, th other things we're going to share in this video is our funding source. That's one of the big things. You can find the greatest deals in the world, but if you can't get them funded, it doesn't matter. Uh, our lead source, how we found the deal, and yes, we're going to cover our actual net profit. And we're also going to do a 3D tour on here. I'm going to take you on a 3D tour of before when we bought the property, what it looked like, and then after. Okay, so let's talk about the deal real quick. So this is uh, this is a home in kind of what I call our ideal uh, market area in a very uh, well established subdivision uh, medium price housing and below this this particular property was in the 200 out low two hundred thousand dollar range and I'm going to cover those numbers there uh, we bought it for 131 131 thousand seven hundred dollars we projected we were going to spend a little less than thirty thousand dollars and have an ARV of two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars I will tell you that buying this property that we Felt like we were pushing the ARV a little bit, and we're also in a, a period of the market, right? So this is now we're in the summer of 2023. We bought this the beginning of the year, essentially, and the first quarter of the year, I believe. And um, the market was starting to change, right? So the market's been changing. So we like, you know what? A year ago, for sure, 215 and fly off the market. Maybe we're pushing it. I'll share with you where we ended up. So we had a gross profit of 38,978. This is not our net profit, okay, what we projected. This is this is the gross profit. The easiest way I can put it is the cost of our purchase price and our material our, our uh, repairs uh, deducting that from that 215 amount. This is what they they use these numbers on HGTV a lot I found. Uh, but our projected net profit meaning after all the dust was settled we had we anticipated we were going to hit a twenty six thousand dollar profit okay i'll show you how we can get pretty granular and pretty accurate on a lot of our rehab flip deals uh so it's not just a guessing game i see a lot of flippers guessing but no we don't we don't do that here so i'll show you how we do that all right so let's cover some things so how do we finance this flip deal and actually flipped it, uh, we finance it with no money out of pocket and no monthly payments well Easy answer for those who follow me, you know that we do um, uh, do all of our flip deals and all of our real estate deals, you know, whether we're flipping properties, buying rentals, uh, mobile home parks, land, commercial, we fund everything. When I say everything, I've been doing this for many, many years, 100% on the initial acquisition side with private money. Now, do we sometimes refinance properties with bank money? Yes, but this is 100% private money. Uh, shameless plug here. Uh, go to privatelenderplaybook.com if you want to learn more about, um, you know, kind of the nuances of the private lender world, how, uh, you know, loans are structured, how to analyze deals, all that type of stuff. Especially if you're a real estate investor and you're going to look at raising money, you really need to build your baseline of education so you know what you're talking about when you talk to lenders. So what was our lead source on this deal, right? This is all also referred to as deal flow. How are you creating deal flow in your business, right? And I, I say this a lot where, you know, if you're a real estate investor, there's two things that you should always be doing in your business every single day. Uh, and, and that's looking for dollars and looking for deals. You should always be looking to raise private money or getting financing sources and always looking for deals. Now, whether you're actively doing that or setting up systems uh, building a team, et cetera, et cetera, to create deal flow. You got to be getting deal flow. So these are just a lot of the different ways that we get deals in our business on a pretty routine basis. Some of these we do more than others, but this particular deal was brought to us from a good old wholesaler. So, you know, if you watch some of my previous videos, you may hear me talk somewhat negatively about wholesalers. Um, 
although I do love them and I love them when they send us great deals, but what has happened over the last five, six, seven years is the market has changed and wholesalers were able to get a premium on their deals and they just their numbers didn't work for us for many, many years for I me mean, for me and my my company. So we've bought we've always bought deals from wholesalers each and every year, but the volume has gone down during during the peaks of time when the market's at, at a high because the, the wholesalers can sell their deals at a premium. And so whenever I was buying properties in 2008, 2009, 2010, we bought a ton of properties from wholesalers. And each, each year that volume went down a little more, a little more, a little more because the, the market was getting um, just saturated by investors. Wholesalers could sell at a premium. But now that things are changing in the market, we're beginning to buy more from wholesalers. So whatever your marketing sources, your deal flow efforts are, are, are at, you know, you need to make sure that wholesalers, you've got a good team of wholesalers on your team to bring you deals. All right, so let's look at some quick before and after pictures. Like I said, a very cookie cutter home, solid brick, brick, pitch roof. We didn't have to replace the roof. You can see some little things that we did. Obviously, pressure wash, painting. Uh, we did some tree trimmings. You can see the difference uh, there. Not even much landscaping, honestly. Um, our, our motto is kind of clean and green. We did not plant sod in this area. You know, could we have? Yeah, did we need to? No, the house sold without it. Um, painted the house. I will tell you that um, when we get into our cost overruns, the two of the biggest items were the garage door ended up um, just kind of dented and didn't do well in the inspection report. And we did uh, some additional fence work because of a survey issue we didn't expect. Um, so here's the after. Not a whole lot, you know, pressure wash, paint, and stuff like that. There was a chain link fence over here, as you can see here. And when we bought the initial uh, property, the survey line was actually, it was a, about three or four feet over here. So we were giving up, I'm sorry, the neighbor was giving up about three or four feet of his fence to us, which we didn't mind. The issue came in is you see a new fence here. So a lot of times, let me go back real quick. A lot of times if we've got a chain link fence, as you can see in this picture here, it's kind of unsightly and not ideal. So sometimes we'll leave the chain link in the back, but we want the good curb appeal. So we'll just install a fence and possibly a gate on the two front sides. But when, whenever we went to do that over here, that's when the uh, kind of issue was like, well, where do we stop the fence um, because of the survey line? So. Long story short, we ended up replacing all of this fencing over here. So here's some before and after pictures real quick. I'm going to I'm gonna hop over to a 3D video in just a second. But it was paint, flooring, you know, just kind of check the boxes, light fixtures, all your basic type of stuff. Uh, granite in the counter, uh, in the kitchen, painted the cabinets. We did not replace any cabinets. We left all the cabinetry. We left the fur down. You know, do we love it? No, but for the the property and the budget, you gotta you gotta be really um, disciplined and not to overspend, and still kind of check the boxes and give a good uh, final product. I'm just going through these quick, and we're gonna hop over to a 3D tour. There's a good shot of the bathroom before and after. We did do a new tub and tub surround. So let's look at a 3D tour over here. All right, so here we go. Here's a little 3D tour of the interior when we bought it. So a lot of people ask us, you know, how we do so many deals or how, how I flip houses um, with as busy as my schedule is. And I say, well, you know, through a lot. <laughs> We've got about a dozen 12 team members on our team now, and we utilize a lot of technology. Right, so most of these homes, this this home for example is a home I never saw. Like I never went to this home. And because of 3D tours and technology and things like that, um, it's really uh, changing the way that we do uh, deals. So you can see here, they had the just standard tile floor before, tile flooring before, Yeah, sorry about that. And there was nothing wrong with it, it was just kind of outdated and ugly. Okay, so we replaced it. So with vinyl. So we do a lot of vinyl. Let's set over to the kitchen here. You want to see side by side. 
you saw this in the pictures, but I'll show you, you know, these were uh, for mica countertop uh, uh, countertops in the kitchen. And one of the things I'll say that we almost always do is we install granite countertops on all of our deals, even in rentals, to be honest with you, uh, just because of durability and granite. If you're doing a level one granite, which that's what this is, um, it's pretty inexpensive. Um, so that's kind of a standard thing we always do. Typically are installing a tile backsplash. These cabinets, you know, we didn't love them, but they were good enough and in good enough shape, I assume. My construction manager decided to keep them and we just painted them and installed new hardware. We typically were gonna update all the light fixtures. You can see some disc lighting and some flush lighting. There's the breakfast nook. So obviously we installed a new light, uh, light fixture there and just kind of paint paint and paint light fixtures and flooring you know is is for the most part what we did let's look here in the hallway not a whole lot to show there now the the downside with this home i'll tell you this is one thing i did not love and you know sometimes it's it's a deciding factor but it's only a one bathroom right so we'll buy one bat bathroom homes, but you have to make sure that you're pulling your comps accordingly. Okay, so this did not have two bathrooms, but all the bedrooms kind of did the same. Paint, flooring, ceiling fans, lights in the closet if they had them. And let's take a look at the bathroom. So you saw it in the, pack the pictures before. It was dirty tub, dirty toilet, the shelving here. The vanity kind of worn out with this uh, medicine cabinet on the side, just not not too pretty here. And so we basically did everything except the vanity. So we just painted the countertop and did the hardware, but it was a new granite countertop, new mirror, new light fixture, um, toilet, tub surround, basically the whole night. I think we probably did a exhaust fan. And so that for the most part, guys, is the 3D tour of the home. So now let's get back into our numbers. Okay, so you saw at the beginning um, the purchase price was one thirty one seven hundred. Uh, projected repairs were twenty nine thousand five hundred six. We did go about five thousand over in our rehab budget. I think around two thousand or so of that was with the fence. Um, five hundred or so was with the garage door. And I and I can't remember all the details. I will tell you that we're also at this point in time going in a, in a time in the market where prices are drastically changing that is really hard to estimate jobs and estimate them accurately I should say because it's kind of a moving target on some of the materials and labor and I was also training a, a new uh, a, a team member that does all of our construction estimating at the time this was done this is actually one of their first uh, deals that they did on themselves so there may have been some errors and things like that but most likely our five thousand dollars of overage was the fence the garage door and just some miscellaneous small things unless we're going you know um 20 or more over on our rehab budgets i don't look too closely i'll just be honest with you there's so many deals going on but we do kind of we also factor in a little fudge, right? We know our repairs aren't going to be 100%, and we try to factor in like a 10% to 15% range if they're off on that. We can kind of live with that because we've got enough margin on our deals. But this deal didn't have a ton of margin, okay? This was a, um, a lower margin type of deal, so let's see how we did here. So that was our... That was our actual rehab uh, final number. I updated these numbers. That's a $33 per square foot cost. So if any of you have been flipping houses for a while, you know that $33 per square foot a few years ago was just an insane number unless it was a gut job. But we're finding more and more and more of our projects are going into the $30 per square foot range. So keep that in mind. I also told you at the beginning, we had a projected ARV of 215. Well, we didn't get that. As you can see here, we actually uh, had to negotiate a little bit to arrive at 211, 788. How they arrived at that number, I don't know, but they did. You have to ask my wife, who's my agent. 
And our hold time was four months. This was critical, okay? So whenever we were going into this deal, we had an LTV of 76%. What I like to stay with our initial LTV, no higher than 75%, kind of that's our minimum. And we're really aiming for the 68 to 70% range, meaning the, uh, the loan to value, what we're gonna borrow or our all in cost on that deal of our purchase price and our repairs are gonna be 75% or less of the after repaired value. So this particular deal was 76%, eh, it's close enough, but it's also getting to be a thin margin deal. So this one, whenever you really plugged in the numbers, it was 79%. That's not recommended. So let's kind of see how this thing worked out. I will tell you that we typically, we're typically factoring in a six month hold time. And I, you know, kind of guessed that with this particular deal, being able to do a really quick rehab, being the price point that it was at, it was gonna sell quickly. So I thought there was a chance to you know, an opportunity on deals like this where I, I teach my students and a lot of flippers like be really careful going above this 75% number right here. If your number gets high, your LTV goes higher than 75%. However, you know, I also talk a lot about having multiple exit strategies, right? If you're flipping a million dollar home, you've got one exit strategy. But on this particular home at this price point, you know, let's say for some reason it didn't sell. We could we could rent this property and most likely positively cash flow or just break even. You know, we could sell it with owner financing. We could Airbnb it. We've got a lot of different options here. So that's why we feel safe moving on uh, forward on deals similar to this. So our actual net profit at the end of the day was 22196 You know, I projected that we we're roughly going to be around $26,000 if we're able to get our previous sales price that I mentioned and um, not go over on repairs and not go over too much. Obviously we didn't do that, but still all in all, you know, this deal was a really, really quick um, deal, less than four months. It was actually just a little bit over three and a half months um, from start to finish. So that really helped us, um, you know, still get a, a good decent profit on here. So let me share something with you here. I don't think a lot of investors look at this. So. Down here at the bottom, you see these are key indicators of a deal. So these are just some other things that we look at, right? And our formula pops up. If it's green, it's good. If it's red, may not be bad, but it's it could be bad with something we just need to investigate, right? So number one says break even or minor profit after holding 12 months. So this is what I call the key indicator of a deal. So if this particular property, let's say for example, we didn't sell it until month 12, we would still actually make a profit. That is one of the key indicators of a good deal because if you've got a deal and you're gonna be in out of the black and in the red, meaning losing money at you know month six, seven, or eight, man, that's too risky for me. That's too risky for me. If you're doing a lot of rehab, it takes time to do rehab, it takes time to go to market, that's that's a that's a no uh, you know, a deal that I'm not gonna move forward on. So I like to see deals that are still profitable, even if it's just slim, just like you're in the black, you know, making a dollar, that's still a, that's a good safety net to have, okay? Number two, ROI, your return on investment will be more than 15% at the six month mark. We didn't hit that um, original projection, I believe that we would have, like barely. So that's just, you know, what is the return on your investment and not just return on your investment, the return on your time, your energy, your effort, and your risk, right? So I always say that I like to look for deals and opportunities in the real estate world that are low risk and high reward, low risk and high reward. So at a minimum, we want a 15% return on the money that we're putting in the deal. Now, I will say, Technically, we did not put any money into the deal because we've you know, borrowed money on this deal 100%. So our return is actually infinite. But what I'm, what I'm really analyzing here is the amount of money that we've borrowed, which is, you know, which is our investment in the deal, whether that money's coming out of our bank account or one of our lender's bank account. That's what I am on the hook for. That's what I'm obligated for. And that's what I'm committed to paying back to my lender. So that's what we're analyzing, right? So 
whether it's your money or private lenders money you need to take that into account and i've happened to have done 500 deals and paid back every single nickel and every single penny from a, a, the lenders that i've bought so uh you know i'm on the hook for this money no matter what even when the deal goes sideways and i've had that happen so that's what we're looking at there and then number three the six month profit will be 50 percent or greater than the rehab cost we barely eat this out so what that essentially is is the amount of rehab that you're doing so in this one was set was essentially thirty five thousand so we want to make sure that our profit our net profit is at least half of that right so that'd be roughly seventeen thousand five hundred right we made a twenty two thousand dollar profit so that once again is something that i'm looking at our risk versus reward ratio is really really important i've seen investors doing a hundred thousand dollar rehab with a projected profit of twenty thousand dollars that's not good that is a rep recipe for disaster and you're going to put yourself in a really bad spot if you're doing really 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 big rehabs with low margins it's not going to last very long right so this is just another just another metric right there of sustainability right these key indicators of a deal are, are kind of steering you helping guide helping make sure that you're guiding uh, to uh, profitable deals and sustainability in your business so all of that being said i hope this was helpful guys if you haven't already please like the video uh, subscribe to the channel lots of content like this where i'm just being real and honest and transparent with you guys on what we're doing in today's real estate world flipping houses and all types of other things in real estate and just giving you uh the truth when it comes to real estate investing and fundamentals so you guys take care and we'll talk to you on the next video